coming upon Charleston from the water by dawn, you can get a sense of how inviting this place must have looked to the people on those ships. Even today, the romantic and selective eye might imagine itself in some exotic tropical port. And although Charleston is a thriving metropolitan hub with low unemployment, lots of new construction, and all the other indicators of prosperity, it is her beauty that her people are most proud of. You may wonder how such a thing as this can exist in today's fast-moving world. The answer lies with Charleston's people, who are, simply, in love with her. Charlestonians cherish every brick and shingle of their city by the sea. They love the signs of her age, the wrinkles, the worn parts. They take care of her. It's a way of life. Herbert de Costa, one of Charleston's most prominent building contractors, is an embodiment of this attitude. His signature is all over town. Well, I suppose I was sort of born into construction business. Uh, my father, you know, was a contractor, my grandfather. So um, I grew up, you might say, playing on the lumber pile. <laughs> my father had a very good reputation in Charleston. And of course, he insisted that everything be done correctly. But I think you better check the plan. Try to make it as authentic as possible. I think we had two plates in addition to the wood beam. And we tried to use the same type of materials and in a lot of cases the same methods, you know, that were used. Because those are very valuable and that's authentic, so we don't certainly don't want to lose those. Hey Robert! And of course the thing that is most satisfying and most interesting is to take a building that is in deteriorated condition and some buildings that other people have said couldn't be saved. And we've gone in and saved them and restored them to their former beauty and grandeur. I think in, in Charleston in particular, we have such a preponderance of interesting and distinctive buildings, you see. So many cities don't have the buildings that we have. So what we should do is find some old hard material and then make these rail caps with this slope on it. Herbert so DaCosta is an up-to-date businessman, but he is also a descendant of the marvelous craftsmen who have gone before him. As you know, we just finished uh, restoring the top part of this building. And so on this fine summer evening as he strolls with his wife through his city, Herbert de Costa has the satisfaction of knowing how much of the rarity and the beauty of Charleston is due to the skill and devotion of her craftsmen. The first you know, fireproof building to be built in Maribel Howe is also an embodiment of the Charleston style. How could she not be? The house she lives in with its masterpieces of furniture, its sweeping staircases and high coffered ceilings is a museum of a vanished way of life for the awestruck tourists who visit it. I'm Maribel Howe. But this is also Maribel's home, even if the tourists' admission fees do help with expenses. She occupies this home with an authority that helps to explain why Charleston looks the way it does today. Because while Charlestonians are Americans, and certainly they are South Carolinians, sometimes it does seem as if they're Charlestonians first. Being convinced that they are right and not having to impress anybody, they don't have to impress anybody because they already think that what they do is what should be done. All right, where else do you find a peninsula city that doesn't have any hot dog stands or any high rises in it? And I think that's sort of like the history of Charleston. Other people in South Carolina decide to reform it or change it or uh, monkey with it in any way and nothing ever comes of it. It's just a little, little one night stand and then Charleston goes back to being Charleston again. 
With exquisite arrogance and in utter defiance of the laws of nature, Charlestonians even claim special powers for their Ashley and Cooper rivers. Well, if you stand here and you see the Ashley there and the Cooper there, and you know that the A Atlantic Ocean is straight ahead, it's not a joke. You know, it's absolutely true that in Charleston, the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers come together to form the Atlantic Ocean. And if you look straight ahead at that sort of blob in the middle, that is Fort Sumter, where the late unpleasantness began. The first shots of the late unpleasantness were heard one day in 1861 when cadets from the Citadel, and they looked exactly like the young men you see here, dragged one of their guns out to the edge of the city and fired upon Fort Sumter out in Charleston's harbor. The ensuing war laid Charleston low and plunged her into a cycle of poverty that lasted three generations. In 1925, Charlestonians were still living in an atmosphere of shabby and tumble-down elegance when an event occurred that would have an enduring effect on American culture. It was the publication of a book called Porgy by a gifted Charleston writer named DuBose Hayward. Porgy had all the elements of a bestseller, true love, jealousy, heroism. The story was inspired by a murder, a crime of passion, which had taken place in an alleyway near Charleston's waterfront where some of the city's poor black people lived. When the great composer George Gershwin read Porgy, he knew instinctively that its setting and characters could inspire some of the best music of his career. The collaboration of Gershwin and Hayward produced America's greatest native opera, Porgy and Bess. I'm on my way. Okay, accent that all the way through, okay? Today in Charleston, Porgy comes to life again. Let's try it. Oh, oh, ready. Oh. Jim Edwards is a school principal by profession, but he's got music in his heart. And so do all the other people in this room. These are the Coraliers, a dedicated amateur singing group putting in long hours after work to bring music to their city. This is that place where Porgy and Bess lived when I was uh, living. And you see there's a gate on the other side? Yeah, it leads you all the way through to Meeting Street. Septima Clark knew the real Porgy so. and the real Bess. She remembers the colorful but violent neighborhood they lived in back in the 1920s. When Porgy, a gentle beggar, killed his jealous rival here in Catfish Row in a fight over the flamboyant Bess, it was big news in Charleston. Bess, um, we call her a high yellow woman. <laughs> she was fair with very pretty hair too. And uh, she was very stout and had a lot of, um, uh, what, some kind of an activity about her when she walks. <laughs> yeah, she was a great person though, I felt. It just uh, too bad. The Porgy loved her so that he wanted to kill somebody about her. Oh, Lord, I'm on my way. Just when Porgy had best to himself, she was gone. Some said to New York. In this famous finale, Porgy bids goodbye to his neighbors in Charleston. He doesn't know much about his destination, not even how far it is only that he's on his way to find the woman he loves.
She, she, don't you know the road? Yes, my Lord, I know the road. She, she, don't you know the road? Yes, my Lord, I know the road. The mainland of South Carolina is sheltered from the sea by a chain of barrier islands. Barely two lifetimes ago, mansions like this one overlooked vast plantations of cotton and rice worked by hundreds of thousands of slaves. Here and there you can still find a few of the little farms that were given to some of those slaves after the emancipation that have been passed down through their families. Dr. Leroy Brown is a descendant of these people. He works in Columbia as a vice president of South Carolina's biggest technical college. Whenever he gets the chance, he leaves the pressures of his job, puts his family in the car, and comes home. I just feel so free when I come here, you know? And I come here and I see my mother, and my mother, she just, she just got so much love. You know, she had 10 children, but she has so much love. When I come in, she hugs me and says, son, how you doing? Listen, I, I mean, I, I'm just like, I'm in a hog heaven. <laughs> that is the greatest feeling in the world. I mean, I'm around 10,000 students daily uh, and, and a many, many senior executives at the college. And nobody says, I love you or even I care about you. Hey, um, how you doing? <laughs> as much as he loved his familiar island home and the warm embrace of his family, a day came when it was time for him to leave. Much more than I had anticipated. I felt that intellectually or mentally that one could still be enslaved. This ain't Agnes. We used to grow up in a house just like this is. And therefore, I sought uh, to go to school and to try to come back and make my mother and, and father proud of me to, to help others. I don't know to want to, to realize the potential of higher education. Because my daddy was born right over there. If you want to make it in this world, you've got to be educated. Since we've been living in Columbia with all that hard rocking thing, you got, when you come down here, I always seen you walking, but in the country, man, you got to walk free and float and kick your, kick your feet up in the grass and stuff like that. That's the way we do in the country. Matter of fact, you know, you you got, you always had shoes. When I was a little boy, I, I was in the third grade before I got my first pair of shoes, and then those were those were the pairs that were hand me down from my next to the oldest <laughs> brother Earl. Beautiful and wild land like this, cut off for so long from the mainstream of American life, is now under intense pressure to be developed for second homes and retirement communities. As far as your eyes could see along right here was just nothing but sweet potatoes. By a strange turn of fate, Roy Brown's home place is now valuable real estate. The temptation to sell has been irresistible for some, but the Brown family isn't taking any offers. For them, the ability to transmit a precious heritage to their young people is worth more than money. When we grow up on the island, you know, when you turn 13 years old, the Bible says you become of a man then, and then all you, 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 you accept all the responsibility for your sins. This is a place that each one of us find. And for, for three months, you come here, all you do is go home to eat and come back here to pray. But this is a real sacred place. Come on, son, I think we better go on back now. Weston, grab that line down there for us. Several miles up the coast, Eddie Gordon runs a crab packing business. For him and the people who work with him, the coast and the water are the source of their livelihood, a somewhat unpredictable livelihood. I'm glad y'all can make it in. I was getting a little worried about you with that hurricane out there. I believe the storm has the crab scared. Oh, that's not going to be much to, for us to work on today. On most days, the hold of this boat would be filled with crabs. But a hurricane lies offshore this afternoon, and the catch is poor. 
These islands don't give up their treasures easily, and beneath the calm surfaces of this landscape, there's a harsh reality that takes years of experience to understand and find your way in. When I first started, I had crabbed and fished, you know, on a recreational basis, but as far as really understanding uh, the intricacies of running a crab business, I was pretty much at the mercy of uh, my employees here and, and some of the crabbers and I had to lean on them fairly heavily. But I found that they really responded. They, they knew that, and they allowed me to lean on them, and, and they taught me. 16. Let us remember this little world on a dock in McClellanville, South Carolina, and feel happy we have seen it. It may not be here for our grandchildren. Probably 10 years from now, this area here will be a, a marina. Um, probably right here will be a, a restaurant overlooking the beautiful view. Uh, condominiums sitting around the point here. Um, it's valuable land, and uh, people with dollars are voting with those dollars that they want to enjoy this view. Some of the more recent developments have come in, and, and I'm sure that's what will happen here. I just hope it's done gracefully and, and protect as much as the environment as possible. So ultimately, this way of life must bow to powerful economic forces which lie like the hurricane, not far offshore. The development of nearby Hilton Head Island has changed the face of the South Carolina coast probably for all time. When a brash young law student named Charles Frazier visited this remote and beautiful place in the 1950s, its few inhabitants were people not unlike the family of Leroy Brown, living off what they could farm and get from the sea. As he contemplated this landscape, Fraser envisioned houses, streets, marinas, golf courses, a complete city blended into the land and water. His concept was ridiculed by many, but today Charles Fraser has proven his idea many times over. His way of doing business may seem informal, but Charles Fraser knows how to put a deal together. Phase one will carry Arrowwood across the road, make the curve, put in the golf course, put in the chapel. Uh, put in the polo fields, uh, and we'll have available... As you know, I'm specifically interested in that uh, 16 or 17 acre yes. commercial tract. And, and fortunately, I have other other uh, excellent people who are interested in it as well, and I hope that you will pay as much as they'll pay, because if you will, uh, then I'd love to have you as the, as the buyer. Uh, when Charles Fraser speaks, it is with conviction and fervor. Development essentially means providing houses for people who've got to have a house. Now, how we do that is the issue. Do we do it in a responsible fashion that looks five years ahead, that looks 20 years ahead? Now, in coastal development, for recreation areas and retirement areas, development here means keeping out ugliness that seems to follow the flow of traffic. Where the American tourist goes, the rampant ugliness of the billboard industry, the rampant ugliness of the sign industry, the rampant ugliness of the, uh, the fast food industry, just literally create chaos in the environment around you. How do you keep them away is the issue. Hilton Head, by now over 25 years old, remains the benchmark by which all subsequent development has been measured. Indeed, the style which Charles Fraser created has been imitated up and down the coast of the United States and influenced a generation of land development. I, uh, I'm not against development. There are certain parts of this island that are so beautiful that, that can be developed so that the, the natural beauty of this island still remains. But not to, not to push away an Agnes house back there. It's just something man cannot recreate. It's impossible. It's just a, a gorgeous situation and a very productive situation. I, I appreciate it much more now that I've been in the business that I look at the marsh I realize it's not just the beauty, there's something growing there, there's something positive happening, and I hope it's something that we're not destroying. 
I believe very passionately that one's duty is to dress and keep the earth, protect it for the next generation and the next generation. Best time of day when the tide is coming oh. in like this. So a great question looms on the South Carolina coast, how to create what is needed without destroying that which cannot be replaced. Let's go west, up country, all the way to the other end of South Carolina, into the Blue Ridge Mountains. The accent is more twangy up here. These people's ancestors didn't come by ship from any Caribbean island, bringing harpsichords and fine china and servants. They came by wagon and they walked. Tough Scotch-Irish farmers from up north. Like other South Carolinians, these mountain people are protective of a way of life that has sustained them for many a year. Cousins General Store carries canned goods, dairy products, magazines, and all kinds of things you need for your everyday life. But on Saturday nights, Cousins is stocked with something that's good for your soul. That's when friends get together and sing the kind of old time music that's been heard in these hills for generations. Right, so let's get together and do this one about the Carolinas, Cabin in the Carolinas. The folks at Cousins don't play music to attract tourists or even television cameras. They play to share themselves with neighbors, to celebrate their commonality and closeness, to be part of the great unbroken circle. They play to have a good time. This is how traditions are preserved in the mountains of South Carolina, not so much in books and in libraries as in the hearts and the memories of her people. Round them up, push them out. Southern 500 for a hell of a big time. Here's another South Carolina tradition, a celebration of fellowship, speed, noise, and exuberance so intense that 80,000 people are drawn every Labor Day to the little town of Darlington to help make it happen. It's called a stock car race. They take this kind of thing seriously in South Carolina, especially this race, the Darlington 500, the original stock car race where the country boys' sport came of age back in 1950. Darlington Speedway is the most unpredictable, hairy, and treacherous track in the United States. The track, as they say around here, that's too tough to tame. This is the fourth turn at Darlington, the turn that so many of the drivers consider is the most treacherous turn. You go into the fourth turn, of course, as you go down the straightaway, you have to come back out from the wall. A lot of the younger drivers have to learn this the hard way and they get their colors put on the wall because of it. As you look into the infield, the crowd is growing by the minute. You have people in here that take their vacation time from their jobs just to be a part of this. It's a crowd that you must see it to, or be a part of it to ever really believe what is going on in the infield. This is Labor Day, when the working man is his own boss. And the people who come here this weekend intend with all their hearts, minds, and souls to have the kind of good time where you let your hair all the way down, where you can be yourself completely, where you can relax and not think about anything you don't want to think about. This is a real get-together of good old friends that like to get out and have a good time, eat a lot of food, get some good fresh air, watch a good race or two, and listen to some good music, and 
Just have a good time without worrying about business or anything. Darlington's the place to see a guy like Cale Yarbrough, who doesn't look all that different from most of us, attain heroism and hopped up Thunderbird. You gotta win this race today. Well, I hope we can. I got a small farm in Georgia, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fans are very supportive, and fans uh, make you do things sometimes that you really uh, think maybe you can't do. And I think that uh, that's one thing that makes auto racing very big, the fans in the grandstands, the fans in the infield. They'll let you know that they are pulling for you, and they'll let you know that, that you have their support, and it'll make you work that much harder. Cale Yarborough is one of the great champions and a favorite of many in this crowd. He was born and raised in Timminsville, just 14 miles from the Speedway. The first race I came here, I was a spectator. I didn't have enough money to get in the racetrack, so I slipped under the fence. Got in here free and watched the race. And uh, since then, I've been... Uh, over the fences, under the fences, through the fences with a race car. I've won this race five times, and nobody else has even come close to that. So I feel like that uh, even though the racetrack has beaten me quite often, uh, I've had my share of beating it too. I think you might like to try driving one of these things 367 times around the track at about 155 miles an hour. An economy model will set you back about 60 or $70,000. But even if you had one, you wouldn't get very far in it without a crew of ace mechanics like these guys. They've been working since dawn. And now in the final moments before the race, they're doing everything they can to get every last bit of performance out of their machines. Cale Yarber's main competition today is a man who drives this car, Bill Elliott, up from Dawsonville, Georgia. Elliott's one of the best in the business, and he's sure on a winning streak but he's never beaten this track before. Record crowd is on their feet as we're set to go. Finally, it's time for what everyone has come here to see. The 36th running of the Darlington 500. He's surprising everybody the way he's coming up through the field now. By the 308th lap, fewer than half of the 40 cars that started the race are still running. Kale's ahead, Ironhead Dale Earnhardt is in second place, but a few laps later, he runs into a piece of debris and hits the wall. Kale's got his problems too. With less than 20 laps to go and Bill Elliott, his only serious rival, Kale comes into the pit in a cloud of smoke. His power steering hose is burst. Hydraulic fluid is spurting onto the hot engine. The crew cuts the belt. The power steering is gone, but it's not enough to stop Kale. He gets back in the race, trying to stay in control by brute strength. Kale struggles to retake his lead from Bill Elliott, but without power steering, it's like trying to wrestle a rhinoceros. For Yarborough fans and his boys in the pit, it hurts. But Kale is just going to have to give this one up. We just have to come back next season. You know, we've got three more races this year and give it another shot. Columbia, the capital city, sits right in the middle of South Carolina. Her state house walls still bear the scars of General Sherman's cannon. 
witnesses to the violence of the Civil War, which just about leveled Columbia and transformed South Carolina from the wealthiest of southern states to a devastated shambles. South Carolina's textile industry provided the base upon which her destroyed economy was slowly rebuilt. For six or seven generations, the textile industry has remained one of the most important economic forces in the state. And there are a few people in South Carolina who are not somehow related to someone who worked in one of these mills. Plant manager Ray Gregory is a fourth generation textile employee. His great grandmother worked 43 years in one of these mills. Ray's plant is usually a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. But today it's just starting back up after a week long shutdown as unsold yardage was beginning to pile up in the warehouses. On an average working day, the men and women of this textile plant bust open bales containing about 25,000 pounds of cotton. Step by step, they turn the raw plant fiber into thread, mix it with polyester, and weave it all into broadcloth. If Ray Gregory's great-grandmother were alive today, it might take her a while getting used to things around here, but she'd probably fit right in. As in the old days, the work is noisy and demanding. And the modern plant needs the same kind of people the old ones did. Strong people to move heavy bales. People with judgment to set up the looms. Dexterous people, fast on their feet and good with their hands. Patient people, people with an eye and a feel for something that's the thickness of the hair. But Ray Gregory's great-grandmother might also notice that today it takes only 300 people to do what it took a couple of thousand to do in her time. But the textile mills of the South are automating. They call it modernizing. In plain English, what that means is that a lot of people don't have a job anymore. That's why Midlands Technical College exists. It's an enormous vocational training institution, one of the biggest schools in the state. Midlands 10,000 students include many workers who have been displaced from the textile industry. Here, they're acquiring new skills so they can qualify for new jobs. The last time we saw Leroy Brown, he was strolling through the high grass of Wadmala Island with his young son. But his professional life is here where he is the vice president in charge of student services. Well, I hope I'm, I'm ha I have something to share with them. I see those people okay. in a struggle trying to survive home. their jobs and their job skills taken right from under them. And, and, and you just got to want to do something to help these people. The system will automatically wrap your line for you. In other words, you do not have to ever return. The, I mean, these are people 50 years old in, the, in, in their declining years, and where were they going to f find new skills and, and pick up and leave and go someplace else? You really had to give them a lot of support and a lot of counseling in order for them to, to accept what was actually happening to them. And that's been my life, to motivate, to inspire, and to make people feel like they've got a sense of self-worth and a sense of self-dignity. South Carolina is providing, I think, at this day and time, uh, opportunities for, for all uh, to, to make it. That is, if you've got the skill, you've got the education, and you've got the training, I think that the agencies here in South Carolina are ready to put minorities, women, into those uh, management level jobs that are going to be help the state to become better. This could not happen, I don't think, 10, 15 years ago. Just across town from Midlands Tech, Judge Alex Sanders has finished another day as Chief Justice of the South Carolina Court of Appeals. He, too, has witnessed the monumental changes which have swept the state. The great burden of South Carolina has been the specter of racism which hung over this state for more than a half century. It's a sad history, obviously a history of which we are not proud. We excluded a large proportion of our population, black women, men and women, from full participation in the society of South Carolina. And we paid a dear price for it. We paid a price both 
economically because it's very inefficient to operate a dual system, particularly in a state that can't even afford one good system. But even more than that, it's been a burden upon our soul, a moral wrong. But South Carolina has looked racism in the eye in the last half of the 20th century and has not liked what it has seen and has an effected enormous change. Every day in his chambers, the judge deals with disagreements, compromises, and the friction of human affairs. Like many of us, he needs a place to get away, where he can think and examine the values he lives and works by. For him, this place is the Congaree Swamp, just a short drive from downtown Columbia. It is altogether desirable, I think, that people who judge and presume to judge their fellow human beings come to places like this. If you come to a place like this, you get an acute appreciation of the fact that there's God's law and the law of nature more powerful, more important, more viable than any law us judges deal with. And you aren't tempted, you see, to play cards that you weren't dealt. In the swamp, you can really be alone. This is a quiet world, mysterious and slow. It's been 15 or 20,000 years since anything really major happened here. What I like to do often on a fall afternoon is come out here and climb up in a tree with my deer rifle and read the United States Supreme Court reports. Somehow the opinions of the United States Supreme Court seem to make more sense up in that deer stand. People sometimes ask me why I bother to take the rifle. Well, I have to take the rifle. If people learn that I climbed up in a deer stand and read the United States Supreme Court reports, they'd think I was crazy, wouldn't they? Abbeville, South Carolina awakens to a new day with scenes as familiar as the rising sun. Most South Carolinians come from towns not much different from this one. And increasingly, these towns are calling them back. Back from the big cities and the big corporations. Back to the relaxed and neighborly way of life that most South Carolinians cherish. Maybe somewhere within you, there's a memory of a place like Abbeville place where you can get a clear sense of your own size and purpose, where you're not lost in a crowd. Abbeville looks like it's always been like this, doesn't it? Well, in fact, it hasn't. Ten years ago, this town was dying. Young people were moving out. The stores on the square were boarded up. Today, Abbeville is thriving, renovated in body and soul, because townspeople like George Settles believed in the irreplaceable human values it stands for. The Abbeville Opera House, lovingly restored to its former elegance, is symbolic of the transformation. George Settles is old enough to remember when the Opera House played host to the traveling vaudeville shows which toured the South. In his imaginative mind, he saw it once again lit up, filled with people, and he heard the sound of music on its stage. Hi, everybody. How's hey, it going George, up there? Uh, you're just in time. Uh, listen, the JCs are waiting to get in for the uh, rehearsal for Miss Abbeville pageant. Can you, uh, can you give us a hand? Sure. Uh, we want to fly in the scrim and and uh, some of the stuff for them here. Okay. Okay. For me, it's almost like a dream come true. Uh, from the first time I walked into the theater, uh, I knew it should be safe, and it uh, didn't seem that. A lot of people remembered its heyday. They understood what it was in its time, but mostly just took for granted that it would never be back. Okay, good. The transition was terribly difficult to do. In the beginning, nobody could see it. Uh, nobody understood the idea of going back. By that, I mean restoring the buildings to what they were before, rather than building new or making them look modern. Okay, okay is that what they asked for? That's yeah, it? Yeah, that's it. One of the happiest parts of the entire project for me has been seeing the young people coming back to town. Um, for a long time, when they left to go to college, they never came back, or maybe to visit once a year or something like that. But now, 
More and more of them are coming back. Uh, we must have upwards of 100 now that have returned, bringing their wives or husbands with them. To have them back is, is really uh, the, the best of all of it, really. <laughs> Buddy and Jean Agan were born in Abbeville. After high school, they went away to seek their fortunes. But a few years ago, they came back because for a close-knit family like theirs, Abbeville held out the promise of a better way of life. When they had the chance to buy this feed store, they jumped at it. Well, you know, you kind of grow up and you think, I'm going to do better than my family, and I'm going to just grab the world by the tail, and I'm going to be rich and famous and do all of those things. And we left home, and we went for that. And I had a dynamite career and just went to the top in nursing, and Buddy did the same thing in forestry, and that didn't do it. You know, we were looking for that brass ring, and we didn't find it. So I guess that's why we decided to come back here. And I think after all those years of looking and searching and, and thinking, well, you know, the more money we have and the bigger house we have and the newer car and the more rings, the better off we'll be. Not so. It is not. We've got a car that needs tires now. We're building the smallest house we've ever had. But I guess we're happier now than we've ever been. The story of Abbeville's rebirth contains a message. Hey, good morning. It tells us to slow down yes, and look around us. Ask some big questions. What's life really about? What do we need to be spiritually healthy? To be at peace with ourselves, our families, our neighbors. Lay more eggs than I can eat. Mama. I've been giving some to my sister's law and just letting them pile up in the refrigerator because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Buddy, what seed was it that they back ordered last week? Well, we're together, you know, the three of us are together. We're all working for this business, and for once, we are helping to determine what we're going to be and what we're going to do. Oh, 25 cents with a turnip seed, please. 25 cents worth. Yes. Abbeville has this richness and energy, not because of the buildings and not because it's an historic little town, because a lot of towns have a lot of history. It's because nobody has allowed that to die. Uh, you get them? Help. <laughs> All right. There's something really special about being able to cling to the past and hold that just really close to your bosom, but at the same time, to go forward. That's what Abbeville's done. In almost every town in South Carolina, there's a monument to the Confederacy. This speaks more to us than just of the lost cause and the romanticism attendant to that, like every lost cause. But rather in South Carolina, perhaps speaks even more eloquently to the tradition we have for inherited memory, passing down those constant truths from generation to generation, from father to son and mother to daughter, which I think has served us well in this state. Let the stranger who may in future times read this inscription recognize that these were men whom power could not corrupt, whom death could not terrify, whom defeat could not dishonor. And let their virtues plead for just judgment of the cause in which they perished. Let the South Carolinian of another generation remember that the state taught them how to live and how to die, and that from her broken fortune she has preserved for her children the priceless treasure of their memories, teaching all who may claim the same birthright that truth, courage, and patriotism endure forever. We've come a significant way in this world. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else but the United States, and I probably wouldn't want to live anywhere else but South Carolina, because we have simply come that far. We have come to the point where we have been able to understand uh, 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 racial differences, not to the extent to which we are that far divided, but understand each other to the extent that we understand each other's differences. That is the key, that is the most important thing that I think that we've done here in South Carolina, to understand individual differences, but to be able to accept individual differences, which brings us closer, and that is South Carolina.
and I love it and I want to be anyplace else.